Aesop in Rhyme The Hare and the Tortoise Said a hare to a tortoise, Good sir, what a while you have been only crossing the way. Why, I really believe that to go half a mile you must travel two nights and a day. I am very contented, the creature replied, though I walk but a tortoise's pace. But if you think proper the point to decide, we will run half a mile in a race. Very good, said the hare, said the tortoise, proceed, and the fox shall decide who has won. Then the hare started off with incredible speed, but the tortoise walked leisurely on. Come, tortoise, friend, tortoise, walk on, said the hare. Well, I shall stay here for my dinner. Why, it will take you a month at that rate to get there, then how can you hope to be winner? But the tortoise could hear not a word that she said, for he was far distant behind. So the hare felt secure while at leisure she fed, and took a sound nap when she dined. So at last this slow walker came up with the hare, and there fast asleep he did spy her. And he cunningly crept with such caution and care, that she woke not, although he passed by her. Well, now thought the hare when she opened her eyes, for the race, and I soon shall have done it. But who can describe her chagrin and surprise when she found that the tortoise had won it? Moral Thus plain plodding people we often shall find will leave hasty confident people behind. The Crow and the Pitcher you must know that a crow felt inclined when she dined for some drink, being thirsty and hot. But puddle or pool her fever to cool, within twenty miles there was not. Then said she, Woe is me, surely I must soon die. When lo, she espied at a distance a pitcher or jug, alias pipkin or mug, which promised the needed assistance. Apropos, said the crow, now I think I shall drink, and I shall be there in a minute. But alas for the bird, still her draught was deferred, for scarcely a cupful was in it. How provoking, I'm choking, said she, but let's see, sure I've thought of a project to gain it. With stones from my bill the deep jug I will fill, then the water will rise till my thirst it supplies. She did so, and so did obtain it. Moral Had this two-legged thing been as stupid as many, though dying for drink she would not have got any, for the good that in life one most commonly gains arrives not by luck, but by using one's brains. The Honest Woodman a certain man, excuse, I pray, commencing in the dog-trot way, for what, I ask, am I to do, when Aesop does not tell me who? This man, with many a hearty stroke, was cutting down an ancient oak, when, as he smote, his axe's head, far from its handle quickly sped, and, to the woodman's great dismay, into the river found its way. Now tell us why, the rustic cried, ye could not on the stick abide. You surely might have stayed with me, at least till I had felled the tree. Thus did the man his thoughts express, and sat him down in great distress. But had not long reclined himself, when there appeared a sprightly elf, who asked the reason of his grief, and promised also quick relief. The man explained, the sprite withdrew, intent his magic power to show. Forthwith he dived beneath the stream, full many a fathom to redeem his woodman's hatchet. But, behold, he found one made of solid gold. 
Is this the tool you lost? said he. Oh no, that ne'er belonged to me, the man replied. Then, said the sprite, I'll try again to get the right. Once more he plunged, once more emerged, and now a silver hatchet urged on our poor rustic. But the clown, too honest, was e'en that to own. Well, said the fairy, I'll persist till I procure the one you missed. Again withdrawn, again returned, the man with joy his axe discerned. Said he, Thou art a friend in need, this is my very tool indeed. Pray take it then, the elf replied, and gave the other two beside. But ere the man found what to say, the friendly sprite had flown away. Meanwhile, the man neglected not to tell his neighbours what he'd got. Well, said a friend, if that be true, I'll go and try what I can do. Then to the place an axe he took, and soon he dropped it in the brook, then sat him down to mourn the same, when, as before, the fairy came, who, finding how the matter stood, brought a gold hatchet from the flood, then asked the man if that were his. Oh, yes, said he, indeed it is, that is the very self-same hatchet, then tried with eager haste to snatch it. But ere the gold was grasped by him, the sprite returned it to the stream. Oh, said the rustic, woe is me, I near again that axe shall see. Nor yet your own, rejoined the elf, unless you make a plunge yourself. Moral A maxim I shall now rehearse, which suits exactly with my verse, that honesty is found to be the best and wisest policy. Although the crafty man disdains the honest man as wanting brains. The Wolf and the Crane A wolf, once forgetting the size of his swallow, tried to pass a large marrow bone through it. Oh dear, said the beast, thinking death was to follow, how careless and stupid to do it. His mouth was propped open by means of the bone, and his breathing was greatly impeded. But a crane coming up, he contrived to make known what kind of assistance he needed. How do you do, said the bird, said the beast, very ill, for a bone has got down the wrong way. But if you can extract it by means of your bill, the service I'll amply repay. Thought the crane, I'm no surgeon, yet all must agree that my beak will make excellent forceps, and as for the money, I do not now see why I need refuse taking his worships. Said the bird, it's agreed, said his patient, proceed, and take the bone hence, I beseech, which after a while, and with infinite toil, the crane at last managed to reach. Thank my stars, said the beast, from his terrors released. Thank you too, sir, said he to the bird. Alas, said the crane, is this all I'm to gain? I was waiting the promised reward. Said the wolf, you forget, I've contracted no debt, since the service was rendered by me. Your head I released from the jaws of a beast, and now you're demanding a fee? Moral. Give your help to a wolf, should he beg for your aid, but you must not expect when you've done to be paid. The Dog of Reflection A dog growing thinner for want of a dinner once purloined him a joint from a tray. How happy I am with this shoulder of lamb, thought the cur as he trotted away. But the way that he took lay just over a brook, which he found it was needful to cross. So without more ado he plunged in to go through, not dreaming of danger or loss. But what should appear in this rivulet clear, as he thought upon coolest reflection? But a cur like himself, 
who, with ill-gotten pelf, had run off in that very direction. Thought the dog, apropos, but that instant let go, as he snatched at this same water spaniel, the piece he possessed. So, with hunger distressed, he slowly walked home to his kennel. Moral Hence, when we are needy, don't let us be greedy. Excuse me this line of digression, lest in snatching at all, like the dog, we let fall the good that we have in possession. The Wolf and the Lamb A wolf and lamb once chanced to meet beside a stream whose waters sweet brought various kinds of beasts together when dry and sultry was the weather. Now though the wolf came there to drink, of eating he began to think as soon as near the lamb he came, and straight resolved to kill the same, yet thought it better to begin with threatening words and angry mien. And so, said he to him below, how dare you stir the waters so, making the cool refreshing flood as brown as beer and thick as mud. Sir, said the lamb, that cannot be, the water flows from you to me. So tis impossible, I think, that what I do can spoil your drink. I say it does, you saucy puss, how dare you contradict me thus. But more than this, you idle clack, you railed at me behind my back, two years ago I have been told. How so? I'm not a twelve-month-old, the lamb replied, so I suspect your honour is not quite correct. If not, your mother it must be, and that is all the same to me, rejoined the wolf, who waited not, but killed and ate him on the spot. Moral. Some, like the wolf, adopt the plan to make a quarrel if they can, but none with you can hold dispute if you're determined to be mute. For sure this proverb must be true, that every quarrel must have two. The Lion and the Mouse A lion, with the heat oppressed, one day composed himself to rest. But whilst he dozed, as he intended, a mouse his royal back ascended, nor thought of harm, as Aesop tells, mistaking him for something else, and travelled o'er him and round him, and might have left him as he found him, had he not, tremble when you hear, tried to explore the monarch's ear who straightway woke with wrath immense, and shook his head to cast him hence. You rascal, what are you about? said he, when he had turned him out. I'll teach you soon, the lion said, to make a mouse hole in my head. So saying, he prepared his foot to crush the trembling tiny brute. But he, the mouse, with tearful eye, implored the lion's clemency who thought it best at last to give his little prisoner a reprieve. T'was nearly twelve months after this, the lions chanced his way to miss, when pressing forward, heedless yet, he got entangled in a net. With dreadful rage he stamped and tore, and straight commenced a lordly roar, when the poor mouse, who heard the noise, attended, for she knew his voice. Then, what the lion's utmost strength could not effect, she did at length. With patient labour she applied her teeth, the network to divide. And so at last forth issued he, a lion by a mouse set free. Moral Few are so small or weak, I guess, but may assist us in distress. Nor shall we ever, if we're wise, the meanest or the least despise. The Fox and the Crane I certainly think, said a fox to a crane, that face, ma'am, of yours is remarkably plain. That beak that you wear is so frightful a feature, it makes you appear a most singular creature. 
The crane, much offended at what she had heard, marched off at full speed without saying a word. Oh dear, said the fox, Mrs. Crane, I protest, you misunderstood me, t'was only in jest. Come, don't be affronted, stay with me and dine. You know very well tis this temper of mine to say such odd things to my intimate friends, but you know that poor Reynard no mischief intends. So the crane thought it best not to break with the fox, but to take his remarks as an odd fellow's jokes. So she put on as pleasant a face as she could when he asked her to dine, and replied that she would. But alas, she perceived that his jokes were not over, when Reynard removed from the victuals its cover. T'was neither game, butcher's meat, chicken, nor fish, but plain gravy soup in a broad, shallow dish. Now this the fox lapped with his tongue very quick, while the crane could scarce dip in the point of her beak. You make a poor dinner, said he to his guest. Oh dear, by no means, said the bird, I protest. But the crane asked the fox on a subsequent day, when nothing it seems for their dinner had they, but some minced meat served up in a narrow-necked jar, too long and too narrow, for Reynard by far. You make a poor dinner, I fear, said the bird. Why, I think, said the fox, t'would be very absurd to deny what you say, yet I cannot complain, but confess, though a fox, that I'm matched by a crane. Moral. Cunning folks who play tricks which good manners condemn may find their own tricks played again upon them. The Cock and the Jewel A cock there was, a sage was he, if Aesop we may trust, who wished to make a meal, you see, as other sages must. With this intent, as heretofore, when on the hunt for grain, our hero scratched the litter o'er with all his might and main. But scarce a minute had he scratched, when, to his great surprise, a gem with golden chain attached, he saw with both his eyes. Alack, quoth he, what have we here? A diamond, I protest which lords and ladies buy so dear, and hold in such request. But one good barleycorn to me has more intrinsic worth than all the pearls now in the sea, or gold now in the earth. Moral The moral here in Aesop's mind was this, there's not a doubt. Things have most value which we find we cannot do without. The Eagle and the Crow An eagle descending one day from the skies seized a lamb in his talons and made him his prize, then spreading his pinions abroad to the gale, bore his prey through the air with a dignified sail. That was very well done, thought a crow, I confess, yet I can perform it still better, I guess. So saying, she dropped on the back of a lamb. But, alas, thought the crow, what a blockhead I am! For her feet were entangled so fast in the fleece that she neither could rise nor obtain her release. So instead of her taking the lamb, you must know, the lamb with great ease ran away with the crow. Moral when little folks try with the great to compare, they soon show their neighbours how little they are. The Compliant Farmer An honest farmer and his son were driving once an ass to town, but wishing not to tire the brute, they would not ride but walked on foot. Well, said a man who soon they met, I ne'er beheld such nonsense yet. Why should ye walk? Why don't ye ride? Pray, what's a donkey for beside? Right, said the farmer, 
Son, arise, and take our worthy friend's advice. The duteous son obeyed with haste, and soon bestrode the unwilling beast. Scarce had he mounted when, behold, two women next began to scold. You lazy boy, at once they cried, why don't you let your father ride? True, said the father, son, get down, I'll ride, and you shall walk to town. The son dismounted, honest Ned, and let his father ride instead. Once more they sped them on their way, and met a party. Come, said they, your legs are longer than your son's, suppose you let him ride for once. Good, said the father, son, you see, there's room enough for you and me, get up behind. Once more the son bestrode the beast, and journeyed on. Again they sped, again they met, a party not contented yet, said they, have pity on your beast, and one of you get down at least. But our good farmer thought at last, he e'en would profit by the past, nor change again, unless, indeed, in one opinion all agreed. Moral Although opinions vary so, tis hard the right from wrong to know, and never would the labour cease of studying every man's caprice. Yet some there are, in which we see, the wise and good do all agree. Let their opinions be your own, and let what they advise be done. The Fox and the Goat a fox, by chance and not design, into a well did tumble. So it fell out that he fell in, which made poor Reynard grumble. A goat that wished to quench his thirst approached the well with haste, but seeing the fox had got there first, asked how he liked the taste. How, said the fox, these waters are delicious, I assure ye. So wholesome, too, that if you were now dying, they would cure ye. Deceived by this vile fellow's clack, the silly goat descended. So Reynard, jumping on his back, got out as he intended. Moral When we take the advice of a rogue, who can tell, but twill end like the goat jumping into the well? The Tortoise once a tortoise complained, though twas not of much use, that he scarce could see over the back of a goose, that his legs were so short and his pace was so slow, of the world and its wonders he nothing could know. So at last he determined to alter his lot, or at least for a season to rise from that spot. So he mentioned his thoughts to a bird that he knew, who agreed to oblige him and give him a view. So this bird and another supported a stick, which was not very heavy or clumsy or thick. This the tortoise enclosed in his mouth very tight, while the bird soon ascended a wonderful height. But an eagle who chanced the strange creature to see, exclaimed with amazement, Pray who can that be? Oh, the king of the tortoises, do you not know him? Said they, tis our honour his kingdom to show him. Said the bird, ere I take that as true, I must pause. The tortoise, impatient, then opened his jaws to confirm his new title, when straight he descended, so his journey and reign and existence were ended. Moral So far had the tortoise to fall, they relate, that he'd time while descending to muse on his fate. Ah, thought he, thus I pay for my foolish ambition, which would not be content with a humble condition. Yet I might have hung safely, I cannot deny, had my mouth not been opened to utter a lie. The Travellers and Bear Two travellers one morning set out from their home. It might be from Sparta, from Athens or Rome. It matters not which. 
but agreed, it is said, should danger arise to lend each other aid. But scarce was this done, when forth rushing amain, sprung a bear from a wood towards these travellers twain. Then one of our heroes, with courage immense, climbed into a tree, and there found his defence. The other fell flat to the earth with his dread, when the bear came and smelt him, and thought he was dead. So not liking the carcass, away trotted he, When straight our brave hero descended the tree. Then said he, I can't think what the bear could propose, When so close to his ear he presented his nose. Why this, said the other, he told me to do, To beware for the future of cowards like you. Moral Those people who run from their friends in distress, will be left when themselves are in trouble, I guess. THE FROGS AND THE BULL A bull, once treading near a bog, displaced the entrails of a frog who near his foot did trust them. In fact, so great was the contusion, and made of his inwards such confusion, no art could readjust them. It chanced that some who saw his fate Did to a friend the deed relate. With croakings, groans, and hisses, The beast, they said, in size excelled all other beasts. Their neighbour swelled and asked, As large as this is? Oh, larger far than that, said they, Do not attempt it, madam, pray. But still the frog distended, and said, I'll burst, but I'll exceed. She tried, and burst herself indeed, And so the matter ended. Moral Should you with pride inflate and swell, As did the frog, then who can tell? Your sides may crack as has been shown, And we with laughing crack our own. THE COUNCIL OF MICE Some mice, who saw fit once a quarter to meet, To arrange the concerns of their city, Thought it needful to choose, as is common with us, First a chairman, and then a committee. When the chairman was seated, the object he stated, For which at that meeting they sat, Which was, it would seem, the concerting a scheme To defeat the designs of a cat. Dr. Nibble Cheese rose and said, I would propose to this cat that we fasten a bell. He who likes what I've said now will hold up his head. He who does not may hold up his tail. So out of respect they their noses erect, except one who the order reversed. Eyes all then but one, but yet naught could be done until he had his reasons rehearsed. I shall not, said this mouse, waste the time of this house in long arguments, since, as I view it, the scheme would succeed without doubt, if indeed we could find any mouse who would do it. Here, here was the cry, and no bells we will try unless you will fasten them on. So, quite broken-hearted, the members departed, for the bill was rejected nem con. Moral. Then be not too hasty in giving advice, lest your schemes should remind of the council of mice. You had better delay your opinion a year, than put forth a ridiculous one, it is clear. The Beasts in Partnership This firm once existed, I'll have you to know, Mrs. Lion, Wolf, Tiger, Fox, Leopard, and Co., these in business were joined, and of course twas implied they their stocks should unite and the profits divide. Now the fable relates, it so happened one day, that their efforts combined made a bullock their prey, but agreed that the lion should make the division and patiently waited the monarch's decision. My friends, said the lion, I've parted, you see, the whole into six, which is right, you'll agree. 
one part I may claim as my share in the trade. Oh, take it and welcome, they all of them said. I claim too the second, since no one denies Twas my courage and conduct that gained you the prize. And as for the third, that you know is a fine To the lord of the manor, and therefore is mine. Hey, day, said the fox. Stop a bit, said the lion. I have not quite done, said he, fixing his eye on the other three parts. You are fully aware that as tribute one other part comes to my share. And I think twould be prudent the next to put by somewhere safe in my den for a future supply. And the other, you know, will but barely suffice to pay those expenses which always arise. If this be the case, said the fox, I discern that the business to us is a losing concern. If so, to withdraw, I think, would be best. Oh, yes, let us break up the firm, said the rest. And so, for you may not have heard of it yet, it was quickly dissolved, though not in the Gazette. Moral some folks in their dealings, like him in the fable, will take others' shares if they think they are able. But let them not wonder who act in this way, if they find none will join them in business or play. The Oak and the Reed The thunder roared, the wind was high, and vivid lightning filled the sky, when an old oak, whose aged form ere now had witnessed many a storm, had borne the brunt and still withstood the wind, the lightning, and the flood, was torn up from his roots at last by one tremendous wintry blast, then headlong to the stream descended his ancient pride and glory ended. The ample waters soon conveyed the oak tree from his well-known shade, then unknown naked hills were seen, with rude and dreary wilds between, and by the river's oozy edge grew weakly reeds and languid sedge. Strange, thought the oak, permit the fable, that plants so slender should be able thus to survive the stormy day which made my stubborn limbs give way. A reed just bending with the storm, then to the oak inclined its form, and thus it whispered, Aged friend, I do not break because I bend. I find it best while troubles last to bow beneath them till they're past. Thus spoke the trembling reed and ceased, for now the windy storm increased. Then to the earth it bowed its head, proving the truth of what it said. Meanwhile the oak with quickened sail was hurried onward by the gale, and scarce had time allowed to say, You're right, ere he was borne away. Of moral here there's little need, since that was furnished by the reed. The Fox and the Lion When the fox and the lion first happened to meet, Poor Reynard fell down at his majesty's feet, so great was the terror inspired. But the next time he met him, not quite so afraid, when the lion approached an obeisance he made, and after his health he inquired. But the third time he met him, old crony, said he, pray whither so fast, I must say to be free, that you're grown somewhat cool and unkind. The dignified lion deigned not a reply, but taking the fox to a river hard by, cooled him, both in body and mind. Moral, thought the fox, whilst emerging in woebegone state, this comes of one's making too free with the great. The Frogs Some frogs within a bog or ditch I really cannot tell you which, yet I prefer to say a bog, for that you know best rhymes to frog. 
these frogs as aesop's muse doth sing requested they might have a king so jupiter in a merry mood straight threw them down a log of wood but who can say how much it splashed or who was frightened and who was mashed surprised that such should be the case nor liking much this act of grace they kept aloof a day or two for fear of what he next might do but see how still he lies said they let's go and hear what he will say so they approached the royal log and there was one courageous frog who leapt upon him to inquire what was his majesty's desire but he of course no answer made so they concluding he was dead petitioned jupiter again who quickly sent them down a crane this gracious prince to all the nation then issued forth a proclamation in which the greatest and the least were all invited to a feast and so on the appointed day legions of frogs stopped up the way now said the king upon this log is spread our feast and any frog who to jump on may not be able i'll raise him gently to the table enough was said for every guest around the monarch's person pressed the king then made a gracious bend to help his subjects to ascend but so it was as aesop wrote he let them fall straight down his throat while those below thought all was right although their friends were out of sight till one who something wrong suspected leapt up and so the fraud detected who can describe his feelings then my tongue cannot nor can my pen scarce was he up ere he was down and made the whole transaction known enough was said for every frog ere he had ceased forsook the bog croaking and groaning as they went for their old form of government moral this fable phaedrus did relate referring to affairs of state but leaving politics alone till we're a little older grown twill be a safer way for us to take the author's meaning thus that folks well off should be content nor make a change they may repent the two vessels i'll tell you a tale two vessels set sail without either captain or crew your wonder to settle they were a brass kettle an earthenware porringer too oh dear said the latter friend what is the matter the kettle demanded at last said the pitcher i think i shall certainly sink i am filling with water so fast oh be not afraid i will lend you my aid hook on to my spout said the kettle said the pitcher oh dear it is you that i fear since if we come nigh of the blow i must die for i'm earthen but you are of metal moral as weak folks oft suffer by strong ones i say that the weaker had better keep out of their way the bear and the hermit once a bear had a thorn in his foot as they term it which it seems was extracted from thence by a hermit so the beast felt so grateful and pleased with the dervis that he offered to enter quite into his service so the hermit consented at length to the plan now then thought the bear i must do what i can to make myself useful and glad i shall be if a service in turn shall be rendered by me not long after this as the hermit was sleeping and the bear was the watch with great vigilance keeping on the nose of the former alighted a fly oh now thought the bear my best skill i must try so he lifted his paw and completed the process but crushed with the fly his poor patron's proboscis up started the hermit 
Base villain, said he, is this the reward for my goodness to thee? The bear felt confounded as any one would, but explained the transaction as well as he could. Well, be sure, said the hermit, when next you kill flies, if on me they alight, just to ask my advice. For I'd rather have fifty of them on my nose than one of your friendly but terrible blows. Moral. Let us always take heed when we render a service that we serve not our friend as the bear did the dervis. Some ills had much better we know be endured than the pain or the danger of having them cured. The Clown Praying to Hercules An ancient Roman you must know, I think his name was Cicero, Wishing to make his garden smarter, bespoke some gravel of a carter. But that had many miles to come, to reach his seat at Tusculum. And then, besides all this, the way was quite knee-deep in miry clay. The horse was lame, the cart was crazy, and, worse than all, the man was lazy. If so, you'll say, I am afraid that Tully's job will be delayed. Exactly so. The cart at length was fixed beyond the horse's strength. In vain the driver groaned and grumbled. Down in the mud all fours he tumbled, and there for nearly an hour he lay. Thought he, to Hercules I'll pray, and this, I think, will do to say. O thou who wrenched the lion's jaws, regardless of his teeth and claws, who drowned the hydra, if I'm right, and Cerberus did drag to light, who flung the boar and tossed the bull over thy shoulders with a pull, captured the oxen, Geron slew, and Diomedes vanquished too, who caught the stag that ran so fast and shot those birds of prey at last, who conquered those great Amazons, and all the stables cleansed at once, two thousand of them, and, I'm told, procured the apples made of gold. O Hercules, so strong thou art, sure thou canst move this horse and cart. Scarce had he ceased, when rolling thunder surprised this man with fear and wonder. Then straight before his eyes he sees no lesser form than Hercules, who soon began in words like these. You impious, idle, lazy fellow, how long will you lie there and bellow, disturbing my immortal neighbours with that long rigmy roll of labours? Think you I'll help you with your load while you lie sprawling on the road? Apply your shoulders to the wheel, nor idly thus before me kneel. Then should the task too mighty prove, I may assist you with a shove. But those who indolent remain may roar for help, but roar in vain. Moral This is the moral of the fable, to help yourself if you are able. THE LION AND THE ASS In the days of old Aesop, it once came to pass that a lion saw fit to make friends with an ass. For, said he, I well know by myself he can bray in such style as to strike all the beasts with dismay. Now you take the rear, I'll proceed to the van said the lion, then make the worst noise that you can. They'll be seized with a panic, I have not a doubt, which will end in their total dispersion and rout. So the ass brayed a tune which he thought would succeed, when the cattle made off with incredible speed. Then the lion fell on them and made them his prey. Only think, said the donkey, how well I can bray. Well, said he to the lion, pray how did it do? Indeed, said that beast, sir, you frightened me too. And had I not known it before, I protest, 
I myself should have run with all speed like the rest. Moral Some folks think their failings for merits will pass, though none will think so, I admit, but an ass. The Dog Invited to Dinner A gentleman, a friend of mine, invited sundry folks to dine. I cannot tell you who, because I was not there, but someone was, who when returned with ready pen, recorded that which happened then. It seems this circumstance occurred. The dog, the orders overheard, for game and fish, and butcher's meat, and much besides, a royal treat. So finding mighty preparations, the dog asked one of his relations. He thought it was, and so do I, a lucky opportunity. This dog arrived, was ushered in, where charming things were smelt and seen. The meat, while raw, so tempting looked, they wished it were not to be cooked. Though then they might have thought it nice, but for the pepper and the spice. Yet as it might be underdone, and some have pepper, some have none. Twixt venison, mutton, beef, and veal, they doubted not to make a meal. But woe befell the luckless cur, whence some disaster you'll infer. The cook, you see, who chanced to find him, turned round and softly crept behind him, then took a leg in either hand, all which you clearly understand, and bore the inverted howling beast far from the kitchen and the feast. Then from the window to the yard was thrown the dog, who thought it hard. T'was bad enough to break his bones by falling headlong on the stones. But this, though bad, was not the worst, that yet remains to be rehearsed. For all the dogs and cats he knew, pressed round with friendly, how d'ye do? Do, said our hero, somewhat gruff, what do you mean, I'm well enough? We're glad to hear it, sir, said they, how did you like your dinner, pray? Dinner, said he, I only wish all you could taste that charming dish. In truth so much I ate and drank, I must acknowledge, to be frank, I was so sadly overcome, I scarcely know how I left the room. Moral Thus disappointment and confusion reward an impudent intrusion. The Mouse and the Weasel of a mouse I have read, who so poorly was fed, that her person quite dwindled away, until being so thin, through a crack she squeezed in, to some corn where she feasted all day. When no more she could eat, she essayed to retreat, but how was she shocked to discern, that her bulk had increased, by the means of her feast, to a size that forbade her return. So she scrambled about, but she could not get out. Said a weasel, your hurry I blame. This advice I would tender, first starve yourself slender, and then you may go as you came. Moral This mouse, it is frankly confessed, might be needy, but that's no excuse for her being so greedy. If less she had eaten, no doubt through the crack, which she entered so freely, she might have got back. The grapes are sour. A monkey some charming ripe grapes once espied, which how to obtain was the query, for up to a trellis so high they were tied, that he'd jump till he made himself weary. So finding at last they were out of his power, said he, let them have them who will. I see that they're green, and don't doubt that they're sour, and fruit that's unripe makes me ill. Moral 
Those will ne'er be believed by the world, it is plain, Who pretend to dislike what they cannot obtain. The Ass in the Lion's Skin An ass who imagined his virtues neglected, And saw that his talents were little respected, Supposing folks judged of his worth by his skin, Resolved the first good one he saw to creep in. Soon after he found the fine coat of a lion. Oh, this, thought the ass, by all means I will try on, Which at last he contrived to throw over his shoulders. Now, said he, with what awe shall I strike all beholders? Then he went to a pond to survey himself in it, And when he had stayed to adjust it a minute, Had had the last look, and felt sure it would do, to his neighbours he hasted to make his debut. Dear, now, said the beast, how provoking it is, Not a soul's to be seen such a fine day as this. I wish, though, it would not hang over one's eyes, Must try to procure one that's nearer my size. Just after he met a stray pig in the road, So he looked as terrific and fierce as he could, but instead of his showing the smallest dismay, The pig only grunted and kept on his way. He next saw a fox, and, to fright him the more, He tried when they met, like a lion to roar. Ah, said the Reynard, think not for a lion to pass, While you act like a donkey, and bray like an ass. Moral. Vulgar people well dressed, will be sure to be known, for the moment they speak, their vulgarities shown. The Man Who Had Travelled A man who had travelled, his story unravelled, and strange were the things he related, till his hearers began to discredit the man, for they were with his miracles sated. So he racked his invention to keep their attention, And at last he declared to them all, That he leaped from the dome of St. Peter's at Rome, Without being hurt by his fall. For, said he, when at Rhodes I conformed to their modes, And in leaping became so expert, That now should they toss us clean o'er the Colossus, I am certain I should not be hurt. This all were agreed was surprising indeed, Provided the whole were authentic. Then the truth to confirm, He employed every term in Sheridan, Johnson, or Antic. But, good sir, said a friend, All our scruples must end, If you would but just leap from that steeple. But our hero thought fit, At that hint to retreat, From a pack of incredulous people. Moral. When people assert an achievement expert, And have only assertions to show it, There is grounds to suspect that they are not correct. The best proof of all is to do it. The Dog and the Wolf A wolf there was, whose scanty fare Had made his person lean and spare. A dog there was, so amply fed, His sides were plump and sleek, tis said. The wolf once met this prosperous cur, And thus began. Your servant, sir, I'm pleased to see you look so well, Though how it is I cannot tell. I have not broke my fast today, Nor have I, I'm concerned to say, One bone in store or expectation. And that I call a great vexation. Indeed it is, the dog replied, I know no ill so great beside. But if you do not like to be so poorly fed, Come live with me. Agreed, rejoined the wolf, I'll go. But pray what work am I to do? Oh, guard the house, and do not fail, to bark at thieves and wag your tail. So off they jogged, 
and soon arrived at where the friendly mastiff lived well said the wolf i can't deny you have a better house than i not so the other then replied if you with me will hence abide oh said the wolf how kind you are but what do you call that hanging there is it an iron chain or what friend said the dog i quite forgot to mention that sometimes you see they hook that little chain to me but it is only meant to keep us dogs from walking in our sleep and should you wear it you would find it's nothing that you need to mind i'll take your word the wolf replied its truth by me shall ne'er be tried i'll have my liberty again and you your collar and your chain moral our neighbours sometimes seem to be a vast deal better off than we yet seldom tis they really are since they have troubles too to bear which if the truth were really known are quite as grievous as our own the herdsman a herdsman who lived at a time and a place which should you not know is but little disgrace discovered one morning on counting his stock that a sheep had been stolen that night from the flock oh i wish i had caught ye whoever ye be i'd have soon let you know i'd have soon let you see what ye had to expect said the herdsman i trow but i've thought of a scheme that will trouble you now so what did he do sir but put up a board describing the theft and proposed a reward of a lamb to the man who would give information concerning the thief and his true designation the project succeeded for quickly there came some half dozen neighbours demanding the lamb but tell me the thief said the herdsman at least come hither said they and we'll show you the beast the beast said the rustic who thought he should die on the spot when he found that the thief was a lion i'll luck to my hurry what now shall i do i promised a lamb to detect you tis true but now i'd consent all my substance to pay if i could but with safety get out of your way moral silly people ask things that would ruin if sent they demand them in haste and at leisure repent the boys and the frogs some boys beside a pond or lake were playing once at duck and drake when doubtless to their hearts content volleys of stones were quickly sent but there were some there will be such who did not seem amused so much these were the frogs to whom the game in point of sport was not the same for scarce a stone arrived tis said but gave some frog a broken head and scores in less than half an hour perished beneath the dreadful shower at last said one young folks i say do fling your stones another way though sport to you to throw them thus remember pray tis death to us moral from hence this moral may be learned let play be play to all concerned the horse and the ass a horse and a donkey once met on the road dear me said the former you've got a great load i'm really concerned at your case from my heart why then thought the ass don't you carry a part at last said the donkey come neighbour i say won't you lend me a hand with my burden to-day i'll carry the panniers if you'll take the sack if you'll stop i can hitch it just on to your back not so said the horse for should that come to pass your owner i'm certain would think me an ass 
and sooner I'd bear any load he could pile than a name so contemptible, vulgar and vile. The ass gave a look, but she nothing replied, for she fell to the earth with her burden and died. So the man coming up, when he saw the ass fall, made the horse carry donkey, sack, panniers and all. Moral we had best with good will help our neighbours in trouble, nor be forced to comply when the labour is double. The Bull and the Gnat On the horn of a bullock alighted a gnat, to which it is likely you'll say, What of that? I'll tell you, this insect thought he was so great that the beast must be weary with bearing his weight. I'm afraid that my pressure disturbs you, said he. You must feel much oppressed by a person like me. But if for five minutes you'll let me remain, I'll remove to some tree which my weight can sustain. Sit still and be quiet, I pray, said the beast. Your weight does not burden my neck in the least. Indeed, I knew not of your coming, and so shall not miss you whene'er you think proper to go. Moral Tis the most insignificant persons we see who suppose themselves folks of importance to be. The Man and the Lion A man and a lion once had a dispute, which was reckoned the greatest, the man or the brute. The lion discoursed on his side at some length, and greatly enlarged on his courage and strength. The man, one would think, had enough to reply on his side the question, which none could deny, but like many others who make a pretense, he talked perfect nonsense and thought it was sense. So said he, don't be prating, look yonder, I pray. At that sculpture of marble, now what will you say? The lion is vanquished, but as for the man, he is striding upon him, deny it who can. But pray, said the lion, who sculptured that stone? One of us, said the man, I must candidly own. But when we are the sculptors, the other replied, you'll then on the man see the lion astride. Moral. The man might have added, if he had been wise, but a beast cannot sculpture a stone if he tries. The Two Frogs The day was hot, the heat was dire, enough to make a post perspire. The ponds were empty, pumps were dry, the ducks were thirsty, so was I. Two frogs resolved, quite right, I think, to take a tour in search of drink. And long they sped them on their way, and many a dangerous leap had they. But there appeared a well at length, which both approached with failing strength. But when they gave an anxious peep, alas, twas twenty fathoms deep. Well, said the youngest, let's descend. No, said the other, youthful friend, for should the water dry here too, I ask thee what we then should do. Moral Deep was the well, not quite so deep our moral lies. Look ere you leap. The Traveller and the Satyr a luckless wight in winter's snow, travelling once a forest through, cold and hungry, tired and wet, began in words like these to fret. Oh, what a sharp inclement day, and what a dismal dreary way! No friendly cot, no cheering fields, no food this howling forest yields. I've naught in store or expectation, there's naught before me, but starvation. Not quite so bad, a voice replied. Quickly the traveller turned aside, 
and saw the satyr of the wood who close beside his dwelling stood here is my cave hard by said he walk in you're welcome pray be free the traveller did not hesitate hoping for something good to eat but followed to his heart's content blowing his fingers as he went pray said the satyr may i know for what you blow your fingers so what need you said the man be told to warm my fingers numb with cold indeed was all his host replied intent some pottage to provide which heated well with spice infused was to his shivering guest produced so hot it was as aesop sung it made our traveller scald his tongue and wishing not again to do it our hero could not wait but blew it what said his host in accent rough is not your pottage hot enough yes said the man full well i know it tis far too hot that's why i blow it you artful villain do you so his host replied with angry brow my cave shall not a moment hold a man that blows both hot and cold by none but rogues can that be done you double-dealing wretch be gone moral the traveller scarce deserved such wrath for warming fingers cooling broth no statutes old or new forbid it although with the same mouth he did it yet this beware of old and young what aesop meant a double tongue which flatters now with civil clack and slanders soon behind one's back THE MOUTH AND THE LIMBS In days of yore, they say, t'was then, when all things spoke their mind, the arms and legs of certain men to treason felt inclined. These arms and legs together met, as snugly as they could, with knees and elbows, hands and feet, in discontented mood. Said they, "'Tis neither right nor fair, nor is there any need "'to labour with such toil and care the greedy mouth to feed. "'This we're resolved no more to do, though we so long have done it. "'Ah,' said the knees and elbows too, and we are bent upon it. "'I,' said the tongue, may surely speak, since his inmate I am, "'and for his vices while you seek, his virtues I'll proclaim. You say the mouth embezzles all the fruits of your exertion, but I on this assembly call to prove the base assertion. The food which you with labour gain, he too with labour choose, nor does he long the food retain, but gives it for your use. But he his office has resigned, to whom you may prefer. He begs you therefore now to find some other treasurer. Well, be it so, they all replied, his wish shall be obeyed. We think the hands may now be tried as treasurers in his stead. The hands with joy to this agreed, and all to them was paid. But they the treasure kept indeed, and no disbursements made. Once more the clamorous members met, a lean and hungry throng, when all allowed from head to feet that what they'd done was wrong. To take his office once again, the mouth they all implored, who soon accepted it, and then health was again restored. Moral The mouth has claims of large amount from arms, legs, feet, and hands but let them not, on that account, pay more than it demands. The Conceited Cur I have read in a book of a mischievous dog, round whose neck there was fastened a large wooden log, for reasons I need not declare. But, not seeming to know for what purpose t'was made, 
He ran to his friends and acquaintance and said, See what a smart collar I wear. We see it distinctly, a mastiff replied, But strongly advise you the honour to hide, Which is what we should certainly do, For instead of exciting the smallest respect, It strongly implies, when we come to reflect, That you've had a sound horse-whipping too. Moral I will not affirm that I ever have known Any lad not ashamed his fool's cap should be shown, Yet many there are that with ease could be named, Who can show their fool's tricks without feeling ashamed. THE YOUNG MOUSE In a crack near a cupboard, with dainties provided, A certain young mouse with her mother resided. So securely they lived on that fortunate spot, Any mouse in the land might have envied their lot. But one day this young mouse, who was given to roam, Having made an excursion some way from her home, On a sudden returned with such joy in her eyes, That her grey sedate parent expressed some surprise. O oh, mother, said she, the good folks of this house, I'm convinced have not any ill will to a mouse, And those tales can't be true which you always are telling. For they've been at the pains to construct us a dwelling. The floor is of wood, and the walls are of wires, Exactly the size that one's comfort requires. And I'm sure that we there should have nothing to fear, If ten cats with their kittens at once should appear. And then they have made such nice holes in the wall, One could slip in and out with no trouble at all. But forcing one through such rough crannies as these Always gives one's poor ribs a most terrible squeeze. But the best of all is they've provided us well With a large piece of cheese of most exquisite smell. T'was so nice I had put my head in to go through When I thought it my duty to come and fetch you. Ah, child, said her mother, believe I entreat both the cage and the cheese are a horrible cheat. Do not think all that trouble they took for our good. They would catch us and kill us all there if they could, as they've caught and killed scores, and I never could learn that a mouse who once entered did ever return. Moral. Let the young people mind what the old people say. And when danger is near them, keep out of the way. The Toad and the Fly When Cadmus lived in days of yore, Three thousand years ago or more, Retired within the shady grot, There lived a toad, deny it not, Who, thoughtful, sleepy, or sedate, Passed years away in lonely state. At last he slept, as it should seem, Beside a petrifying stream, Which ere he woke to find it out, With stone enclosed him round about, So tightly fitted to his shape, He could not stretch, nor even gape. Oh, had he known ere his repose, How many years he had to doze, No doubt he would have settled all His worldly matters great and small, nor left his children fighting battles About his sundry goods and chattels, Who knew not, pardon this digression, Whether they ought to take possession. Three thousand years had he to pass Embedded in the solid mass. I hope this message of stone Was rent free all this time, I own. However, not a year ago, it seems this block was sawn in two, When to the workman's great surprise, The drowsy reptile met their eyes, Who issued from his durance freed, A venerable toad indeed. Then crowds drew near from far to see This remnant of antiquity, Who fully conscious of the fact, Their utmost homage did exact. It happened then, there came that way, A fly that only lives a day, Who thinking it was rather odd, Such reverence should be paid a toad, 
first asked the reason of the fuss, and then addressed the reptile thus. And so, said he, I find it's true, this world's but twice as old as you. A poor ephemeron am I, this day was born, this day must die. Yet I maintain, say what you will, my life has been the longest still. What, said the toad with angry hiss, do you mean by such a speech as this? Sir, said the fly with ready breath, sleep is another kind of death. Your days, though more than I can number, you've spent in one continued slumber. My life, though short it is, I own, has never once a slumber known. I do not reckon in the term, while I remained a torpid worm. Nor you the time you must have dozed, ere stone around you could have closed. Nor when one's half asleep, you see, which you at present seem to be. But when one's broad awake, you know, and doing what one has to do, as has this very day been done by me, a poor ephemeron. Which single day, it hence appears, exceeds your long three thousand years. Moral I'd further add the sense to fix, lie not till nine, but rise at six. The longer you can keep awake, the longer you your life will make. The Lark and Her Young Ones A lark who had her nest concealed, says Aesop, in a barley field, began, as harvest time drew near, the reaping of the corn to fear. Afraid they would her nest descry, before her tender brood could fly. She charged them therefore every day, before for food she flew away, to watch the farmer in her stead, and listen well to all he said. It chanced one day, she scarce was gone, ere came the farmer and his son. The farmer well his field surveyed, and sundry observations made. At last, I'll tell you what, said he, this corn is fit to cut, I see. But we our neighbour's help must borrow, so tell them we begin to-morrow. Just after this the lark returned, when from her brood this news she learnt, Ah, dearest mother, then said they, pray let us all be gone to-day. My dears, said she, you need not fret, I shall not be uneasy yet, for if he waits for neighbour's aid, the business long will be delayed. At dawn she left her nest once more, and charged her young ones as before. At five the farmer came again, and waited for his friends in vain. Well, said the man, I fancy, son, these friends we can't depend upon. Tomorrow early, mind, you go, and let our own relations know. Again the lark approached her nest, when round her all her young ones pressed, and told their mother word for word the fresh intelligence they'd heard. Our children be at ease, said she, we're safe another day, I see, for these relations you will find, just like his friends, will stay behind. At dawn again the lark withdrew, and did again her charge renew. Once more the farmer early came, and found the case was just the same. The day advanced, the sun was high, but not a single help drew nigh. Then said the farmer, Hark ye, son, I see this job will not be done, while thus we wait for friends and neighbours, so you and I'll commence our labours. Tomorrow early we'll begin ourselves and get our harvest in. Now, said the lark, when this she heard, our movement must not be deferred, for if the farmer and his son themselves begin, twill soon be done. The morrow proved the lark was right, for all was cut and housed by night. Moral 
Hence, while we wait for others' aid, our business needs must be delayed, which might be done with half the labour t'would take to go and call a neighbour. THE TWO CATS Two cats or dogs, just which you please, purloined a piece of Cheshire cheese. But when to part the same they tried, they did not seem quite satisfied, but after some small altercation referred the same to arbitration, entrusting to a monkey's paws the whole disposal of their cause. Now then, said he with learned look, as in his hands the scales he took. You say these bits should weigh the same, but one I see will kick the beam, unless I have a bit of t'other. Dear me, now this outweighs the other. What shall I do? Another bite yet I must have to get them right. Hey day, they are unequal yet. Well, I'll adjust them, do not fret, said he, and bit another piece from the small remnant of their cheese. Hold, said the cats, good sir, refrain, and give us back our cheese again. Not so, the learned judge replied, justice is not yet satisfied. A case of consequence like this I cannot in such haste dismiss. Another piece from this must come to gain an equilibrium. Thus he the business did delay, Till scarce an ounce was left to weigh. Once more the cats with hunger pressed, Entreated him to spare the rest. Friends, said the ape, this piece of cheese Will barely pay the lawyer's fees, Who straight devoured that morsel too, Dismissed the court, and then withdrew. Moral from this I hope you'll plainly see How much they lose who disagree. You'd better take a portion small Than go to law and lose it all. THE FOX AND THE HEN A hungry fox in quest of prey Into an outhouse found his way. When looking round with skilful search He spied a hen upon a perch. Thought Reynard, what's the reason why They place her on a roost so high? I know not what the use can be Unless it's out of spite to me. As thus he thought, the hen awoke, When thus to her sly Reynard spoke. Dear madam, I'm concerned to hear You've been unwell for half a year. I could not quell my strong desire After your welfare to inquire. But pray come down and take the air, you ne'er get well while sitting there. I'm sure it will not hurt your cough. Do give me leave to help you off. I thank you, sir, the hen replied. I'd rather on my roost abide. Tis true enough I've been unwell, and am so now, the truth to tell. And am so nervous, you must know, I dare not trust myself below. And therefore say to those who call, I see no company at all. For from my perch should I descend, I'm certain in my death t'would end. As then I know without presumption, My cough would end in a consumption. Moral. Thus cunning people often find their crafty overtures declined by prudent people whom they thought, for want of wit, would soon be caught. THE JEALOUS ASS There lived, says friend Aesop, some ages ago, an ass who had feelings acute, you must know. This ass to be jealous felt strongly inclined, and for reasons which follow, felt hurt in his mind. It seemed that his master, as I understand, had a favourite dog which he fed from his hand. Nay, the dog was permitted to jump on his knee, an honour that vexed our poor donkey to see. Now, thought he, what's the reason, I cannot see any, that I have no favours while he has so many. 
If all this is got by just wagging his tail, Why, I have got one which I'll wag without fail. So the donkey resolved to try what he could do, And determined unusual attentions to show, When his master was dining came into the room. Good sir, said his friends, why your donkey is come. Indeed, said their host, great astonishment showing, When he saw the ass come, while his tail was a-going. But who can describe his dismay or his fear, When the donkey reared up, and brayed loud in his ear? You rascal, get down, John, Edward, or Dick, Where are you? Make haste and come here with a stick. The man roared, his guests laughed, the dog barked, the bell rung. Coals, poker, and tongs at the donkey were flung, Till the blows and the kicks, with combined demonstration, Convinced him that this was a bad speculation. So mortified deeply, his footsteps retrod he, Hurt much in his mind, but still more in his body. Moral So some silly children, as stupid as may be, Will cry for indulgences fit for a baby. Had they entered the room while the donkey withdrew, They'd have seen their own folly and punishment too. Let them think of this fable and what came to pass, Nor forget, he who played this fine game was an ass. THE TOWN AND COUNTRY MICE A plain but honest country mouse, residing in a miller's house, once on a time invited down an old acquaintance of the town, and soon he brought his dainties out, the best he had, there's not a doubt, a dish of oatmeal and grey peas, with half a candle and some cheese, some beans and, if I'm not mistaken, a charming piece of Yorkshire bacon. And then, to show he was expert in such affairs, a fine dessert was next produced, all which he pressed with rustic freedom on his guest. But he, the city epicure, this holy fare could not endure. Indeed, he scarcely broke his fast by what he took, but said at last, Old crony, now I'll tell you what, I don't admire this lonely spot, This dreadful, dismal, dirty hole Seems more adapted for a mole Than tis for you. Oh, could you see my residence, How charmed you'd be! Instead of bringing up your brood In wind and wet and solitude, Come, bring them all at once to town, We'll make a courtier of a clown. I think that, for your children's sake, Tis proper my advice to take. Well, said his host, I can but try, And so, poor quiet hole, good-bye. Then off they jogged for many a mile, Talking of splendid things the while. At last in town they all arrived, Found where the city mouse had lived, Entered at midnight through a crack, And rested from their tedious track. Now, said the city mouse, I'll show What kind of fare I've brought you to. On which he led the rustic mice Into a larder snug and nice, Where everything a mouse could relish Did every shelf and nook embellish. Now, is this not to be preferred To your grey peas? Upon my word it is, the country mouse replied, All this must needs the point decide. Scarce had they spoken these words, when, lo, A tribe of servants hastened through, And also two gigantic cats, Who spied our country mouse and brats. Then, by a timely exit, she Just saved herself and family. Oh, ask me not, said she in haste, Your tempting dainties more to taste. I much prefer my homely peas To splendid dangers such as these. Moral Then let not those begin to grumble Whose lot is safe 
though poor and humble, nor envy him who better fares, but for each good has twenty cares. The Cat and the Fox A cat and a fox held a long consultation concerning the times and the state of the nation, when the aspect of things led them both to infer that a grand revolution must shortly occur. Said the fox, for my country it is that I fear, for as to myself I can always get clear. I have not at present much reason to fret, for I've got a thousand new schemes for them yet. Indeed, said the cat, as for me I've but one, and if that should fail I'm for ever undone. The only protection remaining for me when the enemy comes I must find in a tree. A very poor prospect, said Reynard, I trow. But see, said the cat, they're approaching us now. Then each to his mode of escaping betook, the fox to his schemes, and the cat to an oak, who found in the tree she could safely remain, while the fox with his thousand manoeuvres was slain. Moral Hence it needs must appear that when danger is near, Cunning folks are not cunning enough, and that persons who boast of their cleverness most fare the worst when it's put to the proof. The Wasp and the Snail You ugly brown creature, get out of my way, said a wasp to a snail on a fine summer's day. But how can you move, poor contemptible thing, with that load? and with neither a leg nor a wing. Oh, dear, if I had such a burden as you, I cannot imagine what thing I could do. I think, though, I e'en should go out of my mind if I to that clumsy great shell were confined. But the snail, so resigned and contented was he, still pursued his dull course up the stem of the tree. These remarks on his person could give him no pain, seeing he of his blandishments never was vain. Though it took him all day a small distance to climb, yet his business was always transacted in time. And as for his shell, it will quickly be seen how glad of its shelter the wasp would have been. For the wasp, somewhat vexed that he could not prevail, and extort a reply from this peaceable snail, resolving to do something now he must heed, determined to try how his sting would succeed. But alas, for the wasp, while with petulance fierce the snail's shell he vainly endeavoured to pierce, a slight blow was given by one so expert that the insect was crushed while the snail was unhurt. Moral This moral, I think, may be safely applied, and perhaps it occurred to the wasp ere he died, those who proudly insult their poor neighbours will find that a punishment follows them closely behind. The Fox and the Crow Crows feed upon worms, Yet an author affirms, Cheshire cheese they will get if they're able. For, said he, I well know, one unprincipled crow once purloined a large piece from my table. Then away darted she to the shade of a tree to deposit the booty within her. But it never occurred to the mind of the bird that a fox was to have it for dinner. How many a slip twixt the cup and the lip Excuse me, I pray the digression. Said a fox to himself, I can share in the pelf if I act with my usual discretion. So said he, Is it you? Pray, ma'am, how do you do? I have long wished to pay you a visit. For a twelvemonth has passed since I heard of you last, which is not very neighbourly, is it? But, dear madam, said he, you are dining, I see. On that subject I ask your advice. Pray, ma'am, now can you tell where provisions they sell that are not an extravagant price? 
bread and meat are so dear and have been for a year that poor people can scarcely endure it and then cheese is so high that such beggars as i till it falls cannot hope to procure it but the ill-behaved bird did not utter a word still intent on retaining her plunder thought the fox it should seem this is not a good scheme what else can i think of i wonder so said reynard once more i ne'er knew it before but your feathers are whiter than snow is but thought he when he'd said it she'll never give it credit for what bird is so black as a crow is but i'm told that your voice is a horrible noise which they say of all sounds is the oddest but then this is absurd for it never is heard since you are so excessively modest if that's all thought the crow i will soon let you know that all doubt on that score may be ended then most laughably piped this poor silly biped when quickly her dinner descended moral if this biped had not been so vain and conceited she would not by the fox quite so soon have been cheated but perhaps the term biped to some may be new tis a two-legged creature perchance it is you dr wolf a wolf grown too old for the chase it should seem to accomplish his ends tried the following scheme he gave out that he was an able physician had studied diseases as well as nutrition could amputate either at shoulder or knee and only demanded the limb as his fee but that he remarked was but seldom required as bleeding would have the effect he desired so from five in the morning each day until ten was the time that he fixed to be seen at his den then many who thought themselves rather unwell repaired to the doctor their symptoms to tell and thus far is certain that none of them all had the smallest return of disorder at all said a fox there's one thing that looks odd to be sure it is dr wolf's practice to kill or to cure but i should be glad to be told i must own before i apply which of those he has done thank you friend said a horse for your prudent remark i'm afraid that till now we have been in the dark but i'll sift his intentions and if they are ill i will give him a tooth of his own for a pill so saying the horse trotted off at full speed to request the advice he pretended to need who had scarcely arrived when the bones in the place soon convinced him the fox had judged right in this case so without more ado he went up to the brute and just begged him to look at a thorn in his foot then while the wolf looked at his hoof you must know the horse kicked all his teeth down his throat at a blow and then calling aloud to his friends for assistance the poor toothless beast who could make no resistance was directly dispatched without trial or jury to the infinite joy of the beasts i assure ye moral i do not profess to commend the old horse for the steps that he took in this business of course yet this i may say and be perfectly fair from the fate of the wolf let impostors beware the council of war some wars are called civil though all are agreed that to fight one is very uncivil indeed nor can it as much better manners be viewed to blow out one's brains which is certainly rude but to dwell on that topic is not my design seeing that i admit is no business of mine twill suffice for my purpose if i should be able to furnish you thence with an innocent fable it was during those wars whether civil or not when neighbours and brothers both quarrelled and fought that a town long besieged by the enemy's forces and having no walls and but slender resources 
at length called a council of war to propose certain means of defence from the guns of their foes first a mason stood up and observed twas well known that no substance resisted the bullets like stone but that plan was rejected forthwith on the ground that no money or time for it then could be found a carpenter next for a few minutes spoke and he thought twould be best to defend it with oak not with oak said a blacksmith with iron you mean i could forge such a bulwark as never was seen do but give me the order i shall not be long i'll away to my anvil and hammer ding dong hold your tongue you're a madman said one of the mob said another he wants to get hold of a job then a builder was sure lath and plaster would do said a surgeon oh i'll spread the plaster for you but then as to laths i should question their use oh sir said the builder you talk like a goose order order my friend said the chairman i pray i must beg for the future you'll mind what you say then a shoemaker said though their projects were many that he had got one that was better than any hang your walls with new boots from the top to the bottom not a bullet can pierce them the wet will not rot em this a tanner approved but he added besides that he thought twould be far better done with whole hides next there stood up a man who all thought was a fool for he said that they best clothe their buildings with wool what with wool said the rest yes with wool said the man oh dear said they what a ridiculous plan said the other i see that i shall not be heeded yet i know of an instance in which it succeeded but at last from an attic o'erlooking the place an odd voice was perceived and soon after a face here's an author said some you may know by his looks ah said he you are right make a wall of my books then said one of the crowd who apparently knew them you cannot do better for none can get through them then the author withdrew from the insults of men meekly shut up his window and took up his pen thus scheme after scheme was proposed by them all for defending their houses and building a wall and this it appears was at last the end of it while each was consulting his personal profit and disputing and proving his neighbours in fault the enemy carried the place by assault so that ruin complete and destruction befell it and not any escaped but the author to tell it moral we may learn if we please from a fable like this how absurd and contemptible selfishness is for you see it was this sordid and selfish committee which ruined completely themselves and their city the lame man and the blind two persons once met in a dangerous place when each to the other thus opened his case said one o oh, good christian do pray be so kind as to lend me your aid for you see i am blind said the other good christian tis well that you came do help me i pray for i'm dreadfully lame alas said the blind what is now to be done i can run but can't see you can see but can't run but at last added he tell you what honest friend i will borrow your eyes but my legs i will lend so the cripple consented and got on his back and thus both with safety continued their track moral by this fable you'll see we've endeavoured to show what a little good-natured contrivance can do the philosopher and the acorn a philosopher proud of his wit and his reason sat him under an oak in a hot summer season on the oak grew an acorn or two it is said 
On the ground grew a pumpkin as big as his head. Thought the sage, What's the reason this oak is so strong? A few acorns to bear that are scarce an inch long, while this poor feeble plant has a weight to sustain, which had much better hang on the tree, it is plain. But just at the time the philosopher spoke, an acorn dropped down on his head from the oak. Then said he, who just now thought his plan was so clever, I am glad that this was not a pumpkin, however. Moral The sage would no doubt have looked grievously dull, had a pumpkin descended with force on his skull. Of his folly then let us in future beware, and believe that such matters are best as they are. Leave the manners and customs of oak trees alone, of acorns and pumpkins, and look to our own. THE MILKMAID A milkmaid, who poised a full pail on her head, thus mused on her prospects in life, it is said. Let's see, I should think that this milk will procure one hundred good eggs, or four score, to be sure. Well then, stop a bit. It must not be forgotten. Some of these may be broken, and some may be rotten. But if twenty for accidents should be detached, it will leave me just sixty sound eggs to be hatched. Well, sixty sound eggs. No, sound chickens, I mean. Of these, some may die. We'll suppose seventeen. Seventeen, not so many. Say ten at the most, which will leave fifty chickens to boil or to roast. But then there's their barley. How much will they need? Why, they take but one grain at a time when they feed, so that's a mere trifle. Now then, let us see, at a fair market price, how much money there'll be. Six shillings a pair. Five. Four. Three and six. To prevent all mistakes, that low price I will fix. Now what will that make? Fifty chickens, I said. Fifty times three and sixpence. I'll ask Brother Ned. Oh, but stop. Three and sixpence a pair, I must sell them. Well, a pair is a couple. Now then, let us tell them. A couple in fifty will go. My poor brain. Why, just a score times, and five pair will remain. Twenty-five pair of fowls. Now, how plaguesome it is, that I can't reckon up such money as this. Well, there's no use in trying, so let's give a guess. I will say twenty pounds, and it can't be no less. Twenty pounds, I am certain, will buy me a cow, thirty geese and two turkeys, eight pigs and a sow. Now if these turn out well, at the end of the year, I shall fill both my pockets with guineas, tis clear. Then I'll bid that old tumble-down hovel good-bye. My mother she'll scold, and my sisters they'll cry. But I won't care a crow's egg for all they can say. I shan't go to stop with such beggars as they. But forgetting her burden, when this she had said, the maid superciliously tossed up her head, when alas, for her prospects, her milk pail descended, and so all her schemes for the future were ended. Moral This moral, I think, may be safely attached. Reckon not on your chickens before they are hatched. THE TRAVELERS AND THE PURSE Two friends once were walking in sociable chat, when a purse one espied on the ground. Well, come, said he, thank my good fortune for that. What a large sum of money I've found. Nay, do not say I, said his friend, for you know, tis but justice to share it with me. 
I share it with you, said the other, how so? He who found it the owner should be. Be it so, said his friend, but what sound do I hear? Stop, thief, one is calling to you. He comes with a constable close in the rear. Said the other, oh, what shall we do? Nay, do not say we, said his friend, for you know you claimed the sole right to the prize, and since all the money was taken by you, with you the dishonesty lies. Moral When people are selfish, dishonest and mean, their nature in dealing will quickly be seen. If the business in question be pleasure or profit, then each thinks of course he should have the whole of it. But if it should happen, tis danger or toil, then indeed they will vote for dividing the spoil. Mercury and the Sculptor We've often made the beasts and birds to speak their minds and utter words, so sure twill make but little odds to introduce the heathen gods. And if the fable's understood, I think you'll say the moral's good. But should you not approve the same, Aesop, not I, must bear the blame. Mercury, wishing much to know how he was liked by men below, disguised himself in shape of man, as well we know such beings can, and to a sculptor's shop descended, where statues of the gods were vended. There Jupiter and Juno stood, in bronze, in marble, and in wood. Mars and Minerva richly dressed, and Mercury amongst the rest. Then said he to the sculptor, Sir, pray what's the price of Jupiter? The sum was named without delay, and what do you ask for Juno, pray? A trifle more, the man replied, she's more esteemed than most beside. And what for that upon the shelf? said Mercury, nodding at himself. Oh, said the man, his worth is small, I never charge for him at all, but when the other gods are bought, I always give him in for naught. Moral. You ask me what I think of you, you're foolish and conceited too. No persons thus for praise will seek, but those who are both vain and weak. The Chameleon Two friends, B and A, were disputing one day on a creature they'd both of them seen. But who would suppose the debate that arose was whether twas scarlet or green? Said B, if you're right, I will own black is white, or that two with two added make eight. And so will I too, replied A, when you show that the creature is green as you state. Sir, it was, I maintain, I affirm it again, am I not to believe my own eyes? It was not, replied A, it was scarlet, I say, which none but a madman denies. Then said C, my good fellow, you'll find it is yellow, you surely have never been near it. That cannot be true, for I'm certain twas blue, said another who happened to hear it. Oh, said D, it's absurd, if you'll credit my word, the creature was brown as a berry. Not brown, sir, said Jack, when I saw it twas black. Then the neighbours began to be merry. Come, said E, hold your tongue, you are all of you wrong, or at least you are none of you right. Then a box he displayed where the creature was laid, when this marvellous lizard was white. Good people, said I, a chameleon's dye, he can change, any colour to suit. Now if this had been known, all must candidly own, you would not have commenced the dispute. Moral This great altercation showed small information, as such disputes constantly do. For ignorant minds, one most commonly finds, are excessively positive too. 
The Solar Phenomenon An astronomer gazing, as oft he had done, through a very long telescope aimed at the sun, descried on a sudden a spot on his face, so large as to darken one-third of his rays. O Newton, O Haley, were ye but alive, what name to this monster I ask would you give? Like no other spot on his disc does it seem, as maculae faculae neither of them. But what do I see? The phenomenon moves, and there are its legs too, which certainly proves that it must be an animal. Awful indeed, for its length half a million of miles must exceed. If so, then the question must needs be decided, which has for so long all the learned divided. For now tis as plain as the nose on my face, that the sun is in truth an inhabited place. O oh, all ye philosophers, moralists, sages, who have puzzled your brains on this subject for ages, Old Thales, Copernicus, Newton, Descartes, draw near if you can, and the truth I'll impart. He ceased, but he scarcely an ending had made, when the shades of those worthies his summons obeyed, and in low hollow voices demanded in haste, for what reason he'd called them, and broken their rest. Oh, indeed, are you come, said our hero, surprised, why, I did not suppose, as ye all had demised, what I said could have reached you, but, as it is so, forthwith I'll proceed the huge monster to show. So saying, to each he the telescope handed, and quickly of each his opinion demanded. Said Newton, that there is some creature I own, but I do not believe it exists in the sun. Nor I, said Copernicus, Thales, and all, in fact we believe tis no wonder at all. Then pray, said our hero, explain what you see, and say what you take this appearance to be. Said Newton, unscrew the last lens from your glass. The astronomer quickly obeyed, and, alas, for his fame and his theory, what should he descry? when he opened the end of his tube, but a fly. Moral. Examine them well, ere you speak of new wonders, t'will save you from many ridiculous blunders. The Wind and the Sun The wind and the sun had a bet. The wayfarer's cloak, which should get, Blew the wind, the cloak clung. Shone the sun, the cloak flung. Showed the sun had the best of it yet. Moral, true strength is not bluster. The Frightened Lion A bullfrog, according to rule, sat a croak in his usual pool, and he laughed in his heart, as a lion did start in a fright from the brink of the pool. Moral, imaginary fears are the worst. The Married Mouse So the mouse had Miss Lion for bride. Very great was his joy, and his pride. But it chanced that she put on her husband her foot, and the weight was too much, so he died. Moral, one may be too ambitious. The Lazy Housemaids Two maids killed the rooster, whose warning awoke them too soon every morning. But Small were their gains, for their mistress took pains to rouse them herself without warning. Moral, laziness is its own punishment. The Snake and the File A snake in a fix 
tried a file for a dinner. "'Tis not worth your while," said the steel. "'Don't mistake. I'm accustomed to take, to gives, not the way of a file. Moral, we may meet our match. THE DOG IN THE MANGER A cow sought a mouthful of hay, but a dog in the manger there lay, and he snapped out, How now? When, most mildly, the cow adventured a morsel to pray. Moral, don't be selfish. Horse and Man When the horse first took man on his back To help him the stag to attack, How little his dread, as the enemy fled, Man would make him his slave and his hack. Moral, advantages may be dearly bought, THE ASS AND THE ENEMY Get up, let us flee from the foe, said the man. But the ass said, Why so? Will they double my load, or my blows? Then, by goad and by stirrup, I've no cause to go. Moral, your reasons are not mine. THE FOX AND THE MOSQUITOES Being plagued with mosquitoes one day, said old fox, Pray, don't send them away, For a hungrier swarm would work me more harm. I had rather the full ones should stay. MORAL There were politicians in Aesop's time. The miser and his gold. He buried his gold in a hole. One saw, and the treasure he stole, said another. What matter? Don't raise such a clatter. You can still go and sit by the hole. Moral. Use alone gives value. THE GOLDEN EGGS A golden egg, one every day, That simpleton's goose used to lay. So he killed the poor thing, Swifter fortune to bring, And dined off his fortune that day. Moral, greed overreaches itself. THE FIR AND THE BRAMBLE The fir tree looked down on the bramble. Poor thing, only able to scramble about on the ground. Just then an axe sound made the fir wish himself but a bramble. Moral, pride of place has its disadvantages. THE TREES AND THE WOODMAN The trees ask of man what he lacks. One bit, just to handle my axe. All he asks, well and good, but he cuts down the wood, so well does he handle his axe. Moral, give me an inch, and I'll take an L. THE HEART AND THE VINE A heart, by the hunters pursued, safely hid in a vine, till he chewed the sweet tender green, and, through shaking leaves seen, he was slain by his ingratitude. Moral, 
Spare your benefactors. The man and the snake. In pity he brought the poor snake to be warmed at his fire. A mistake, for the ungrateful thing wife and children would sting. I have known some as bad as the snake. Moral, beware how you entertain traitors. THE FOX AND THE MASK A fox with his foot on a mask Thus took the fair semblance to task. You're a real handsome face, But what part of your case Are your brains in, good sir, let me ask? Moral, masks are the faces of shams. THE VAIN JACKDAW FINE FEATHERS, JACK THOUGHT, MAKE FINE FOWLS, I'LL BE ENVIED OF BATS AND OF OWLS, BUT THE PEACOCK'S PROUD EYES SAW THROUGH HIS DISGUISE, AND JACK FLED THE ASSEMBLY OF FOWLS. MORAL, BORROWED PLUMES ARE SOON DISCOVERED. THE PEACOCK'S COMPLAINT The peacock considered it wrong that he had not a nightingale's song, so to Juno he went. She replied, Be content with thy having, and hold thy fool's tongue. Moral, do not quarrel with nature. THE TWO CRABS So awkward, so shambling a gait. Mrs. Crabb did her daughter berate, who rejoined, It is true, I am backward, but you needed lessons in walking quite late. Look at home, is the moral. Brother and Sister Twin children. The girl she was plain, the brother was handsome and vain. Let him brag of his looks, father said. Mind your books. The best beauty is bred in the brain. Moral, handsome is as handsome does. The fox without a tail. Said fox, minus tail in a trap. My friends, here's a lucky mishap. Give your tails a short lease. But the foxes weren't geese, and none followed the fashion of trap. Yet some fashions have no better reason, is the moral. THE BLIND DOE A poor half-blind doe, her one eye kept shoreward, all danger to spy, as she fed by the sea. Poor innocent, she was shot from a boat passing by. Moral, watch on all sides. THE GEESE AND THE CRANES The geese joined the cranes in some wheat. All was well, till, disturbed at their treat, light-winged, the cranes fled. But the slow geese, well fed, couldn't rise, and were caught in retreat. Moral, beware of enterprises where the wrists are not equal. THE TRUMPETER TAKEN PRISONER A trumpeter prisoner made, hoped his life would be spared when he said he'd no part in the fight. But they answered him, Right, but what of the music? you made. Moral, songs may serve a cause as well as swords. Neither beast nor bird. A beast he would be, or a bird, as might suit, thought the bat. But he erred. When the battle was done, he found that no one would take him for friend at his word.
Between two stools you may come to the ground, is the moral. THE STAG IN THE OX STALL Safe enough lay the poor hunted deer in the ox stall, with nothing to fear from the careless-eyed men, till the master came. Then there was no hiding place for the deer. Moral, an eye is keen in its own interest. THE DEER AND THE LION from the hounds the swift deer sped away to his cave, where in past times he lay well concealed, unaware of a lion crouched there, for a spring that soon made him his prey. Moral, fate can meet as well as follow. The Lion in Love Though the lion in love let them draw all his teeth and pare down every claw, he'd no bride for his pains, for they beat out his brains ere he set on his maiden a paw. Moral, our very means may defeat our ends. The Cat and Venus Might his cat be a woman? he said. Venus changed her. The couple were wed. But a mouse in her sight metamorphosed her quite, and for bride a cat found he instead. Moral, nature will out. THE HARES AND THE FROGS Timid hares from the trumpeting wind fled as swift as the fear in their mind, till in fright, from their fear, from the green sedges near, leaping frogs left their terror behind. Moral, our own are not the only troubles. THE PORCUPINE, SNAKE, AND COMPANY Going shares with the snakes, Porcupine said, The best of the bargain is mine. Nor would he back down, When the snakes would disown the agreement His quills made them sign. Moral, hasty partnerships may be repented of. THE BEAR AND THE BEES their honey I'll have when I please. Who cares for such small things as bees? said the bear. But the stings of these very small things left him not very much at his ease. Moral, the weakest united may be strong to avenge. The Bundle of Sticks To his sons who fell out, father spake, This bundle of sticks you can't break. Take them singly, with ease, You may break as you please. So, dissension, your strength will unmake. Strength is in unity, is the moral. The Farmer's Treasure Dig deeply, my sons, through this field. There's a treasure. He died, unrevealed the spot where twas laid. They dug as he bade, and the treasure was found in the yield. Moral, productive labor is the only source of wealth. The cock the ass and the lion. The ass gave a horrible bray. Cock crowed. Lion scampered away. Ass judged he was scared by the bray, and so dared to pursue. Lion ate him, they say. Moral, don't take all the credit to yourself. FORTUNE AND THE BOY 
A boy heedless slept by the well by Dame Fortune awaked. Truth to tell, said she, Hadst been drowned, Twould have surely been found this by fortune, Not folly beset. Moral, fortune is not answerable For our want of foresights. THE FISHERMAN AND THE FISH Prayed the fish, as the fisherman took him, A poor little mite from his hook, Let me go, I'm so small. He replied, Not at all, you're the biggest, perhaps, in the brook. Moral, a little certainty is better than a great chance. THE ASS and the sick lion. Crafty lion, perhaps with the gout, kept his cave where, to solve any doubt, many visitors go. But the ass, he said, No, they go in, but I've seen none come out. Moral. Reason from results. <laughs> 